job and found himself witness to a battle. From the start, it seemed like a losing battle. It looks like it's only gonna be a matter of time before the fort has to surrender. Fort McHenry survives six hours of continuous shelling. But inside its walls lies a weak link that could destroy the entire fort. A deadly weakness, hundreds of barrels of unprotected black powder. The uh, Achilles heel of Fort McHenry was indeed its powder magazine. And this powder magazine had been built decades earlier, and it was a brick vault, and it had not been properly covered with a huge pile of earth. 30,000 pounds of gunpowder. Twice the demolition power of this quarry blast. If the poorly shielded magazine were to explode, the fort would crumble and Baltimore would be lost. Then a direct hit. The fort's commander, George Armistead, can only wait for the inevitable. But miraculously, this shell does not explode. He's very lucky. The garrison and the fort likely would have been decimated. Armistead realized he had a real serious issue at hand. Armistead's soldiers quickly moved the barrels to relative safety under the fort's rear walls. The British don't know how close they came to victory. So many of their shells are going long or short or not exploding at all. Admiral Coburn complains that they're as useless as tossing biscuits at a wall. They move closer. As they sail within a mile and a half of the fort, American artillery take advantage of the closer range. A massive roar shakes the harbor. McHenry's cannons are effective at last. The British ship Devastation suffers a direct hit. Five more shells strike the artillery ship Volcano. Forced back, the British Navy redoubles the barrage. The Congreve rocket's red glare lights up the skies over the harbor. It was like a fireworks display. People who watched it were enthralled. They were terrified of the noise, absolutely terrified. But they saw a kind of beauty in it. The heavy fire goes on and on. Aboard an enemy attack ship, Francis Scott Key hears the British plans for Baltimore and fears the worst. He knows that the level of hatred that's directed at the city would probably mean death and destruction of, of the town. The barrage from the water is constant, and with British infantry marching on the city's borders, Key knows Baltimore's fate looks grim. Key paced the deck of his ship in the darkness, hoping the explosions would continue, because if they didn't, he knew that the fort had capitulated. The siege lasts all night. As dawn nears, there is a sudden silence. Key was on board the ship wondering and asking himself what flag would be raised over the fort. The morning mist began to clear and he made out the stars and stripes flying above the fort. The American experiment, the American nation for that moment was surviving.
Mary Pickersgill's masterpiece unfurls over the fort. Never before had he looked with such reverence upon the symbol of his country. Never before had the flag had such a sheen to its glory. It was the glory of victory. The wool catches the wind. The stars and stripes wave in the face of the enemy. The British are convinced the fort cannot be breached. Baltimore has been saved. On board a retreating warship, Key is struck with what he later called an inspiration not to be resisted. He wrote down everything that tumbled through his mind while the intensity of the moment lasted. The experience had shaken him so to the core that he had no other outlet that would mean as much to him as to take out a piece of paper and to write about it. Freed by the British and safe in a Baltimore hotel room, Key drafts four stanzas. The first relives the uncertain moments before dawn and the battle itself. Key calls it the defense of Fort McHenry. His original draft survives at the Maryland Historical Society. It's just a very plain, simple piece of paper, not even any hotel letterhead on it. Um, Key didn't even sign it. Um, very unpretentious, I think. The poem is published and set to the melody of a popular song called To Anacreon in Heaven. The song was originally written for an exclusive gentleman's drinking club in London. At an octave and a half, performances of the tune would have only been improved by alcohol. It was a popular tune that a lot of people knew, and he realized it happened to fit relatively well rhythmically with the poem that he'd written. Key's song told a story people wanted to hear. In today's language, it went viral. Key's words, as they're spread around the country, created this indelible image, you know, not unlike what the picture of the Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima, or the firefighters putting the flag up at World Trade Center after the 9-11 attack. In an era where we didn't have photography, Key's words created this painting that everyone around the country was able to visualize. He's putting the listener back in his place. This is what he was thinking and feeling at that moment. Does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave? Question mark. What if the answer is yes, that flag does still wave? What does that mean for the, the country and the nation and survival? But what if the answer is no? What does that mean for the nation? And I want you to picture in your mind, when you're singing the word wave, I want you to picture this. When it waves in the wind, it is inspiring. It looks alive. It looks like a heart beating or, or a living thing when it waves, right? And the voice has vibrato and tone quality in it coming right out of you. Wave is what you want to picture in your mind and you want your audience with the ringing of your voice to feel a waving flag. Sure. Oh, say. A surge of patriotic feeling follows the war. It's a breakout moment for the American flag. What key really started was the transformation of the flag from a military utilitarian symbol to something that embodied new definitions of American identity and ideals. They have become this iconic symbol for this nation, this symbol 
that people are willing to fight and die for. The song catches on and never lets go. It's played at a sporting event for the first time in 1918. People were simply singing it so much that the government decided to make it the national anthem. More than a century after Key wrote it, in 1931, Congress officially makes the Star Spangled Banner the national anthem. It was never commissioned, and it was done by an amateur. And I think, what can be more American than that? Official status comes with a rule book, hats off, hands over hearts. And in the military, a band must play it through to the end, no matter what. When Japanese planes first began bombing Pearl Harbor, Navy musicians were mid-song on the deck of the USS Arizona. As explosions burst around them and the battleship began to sink, the musicians played the national anthem to its end. Star Spangled Banner is about one battle, one specific point in time, one night, and that journey from fear to triumph. If ever in your life as a singer, you had to communicate an idea, the national anthem is your time to do it. And at the heart of that idea is the flag. We exhibit it as a nation when we're happy and, and full of pride for our accomplishments, like planting it on the moon. We've used it at times of great sorrow and loss. And we'll hold it up and we'll say, this flag represents my ideals and what I think. Most people couldn't probably tell you what the flags of other countries look like, but almost everybody can tell you what the American flag looks like. Francis Scott Key asked a question. 200 years later, we can still proudly answer yes. That star-spangled banner yet waves. <laughs>